In 2012, my father, Victor Kennedy, read a book called No More Tears in My Eyes, the story of Kathleen Kilban. Kathleen's story affected him deeply, so much so that the following year he and I visited her grave on Ackle Island, and I filmed him reading out a letter he had written to her. And so began a journey to share Kathleen's sad but inspiring story with the world. Over the course of eight years, we made six films about Kathleen, wrote and published a book about her, and designed and printed many prayer and novena cards and booklets. We have gathered stories from people who Kathleen has helped through their prayers to her. Some of these stories can be seen as possible miracles, and we have created a Facebook page in her name. We would not know of Kathleen if it were not for two people, the first one being Brother Morris Anselm Conway, a Christian brother who befriended Kathleen at the TB Sanatorium in County Mayo in 1946. For those of you who are unfamiliar with Kathleen's story, here is a brief summary. Kathleen was born of Irish parents in Perth, Scotland in 1933. She lost her mother to tuberculosis when she was only three years old and she was placed in an orphanage. In 1945 Kathleen's health was failing and she was sent to live on Ackle Island in County Mayo, Ireland with her grandmother. Eight months later she was diagnosed with tuberculosis and she was admitted to Cray Sanatorium, Ballinrobe. Brother Conway was very impressed with Kathleen's piety and her devotion to the Virgin Mary. She was a selfless child, he thought of others before herself, and on the night of her death she prayed for a fellow patient who was suffering from a severe migraine. A patient who admitted afterwards to Brother Conway that she never again suffered from headaches. Brother Conway wrote of Kathleen, It is nice to remember those evenings of long ago when one felt so close to a saint. Straight away he started telling people about her, even the schoolboys at the local school where he taught. The boys, moved by Kathleen's plight, sent her gifts at Christmas time. After her passing, Brother Conway wrote an obituary for her, which appeared in the Western People newspaper on November 1st, 1947. He then set about writing down her story in full. He made at least six copies of it in his own handwriting, and he gave them out to friends. And that is how it stayed for over 50 years. Just a few friends of Brother Conway and members of her family knowing about Kathleen. Then in 2003, Father Brian McEvitt published Kathleen's story as written by Brother Conway. He is the second person we must thank. This brought Kathleen's story to a far wider audience. And it was this book my father read. Sadly, this book is now out of print, but it has not completely disappeared as it can be found on the Internet Archive. It was in June 2013 that we went to the west of Ireland. Our main filming project was The Quiet Leprechaun, a spoof parody film of John Wayne's The Quiet Man. While the leprechaun was fully scripted and planned down to the last detail, Kathleen's film rested mainly upon the letter Victor had wrote, which he would read out at Kathleen's grave. Beyond that, we would visit and film at Cray Sanatorium and at Brother Conway's grave in Ballinrobe 
writing any narration or words Victor wanted to say as we went along. It was on a Sunday when we visited Kathleen's final resting place at Kildarnet Cemetery on Ackle Island. We tidied up her grave before we started filming. At first, Victor was hesitant. Okay. This was an important moment for him. Um, wait a minute, I get it. It is the 9th of June, 2013. He read out the letter he had written to Kathleen and then recited the Chaplet of the Divine Mercy. This was all done in one take, which lasted for 12 minutes. The audio track you hear in the film is from this one take. I'm standing here in Kildownet Graveyard in Achill Island in County Mayo, west of Ireland, on the edge of the Atlantic Ocean, beside the grave of a little girl called Kathleen Kilban, who died on the 7th a of October. We would know nothing about, but for this little book, no more tears in my eyes. Kathleen spent the last year of her life in a sanatorium. Kathleen in said, Rome. It's very lonely in the graveyard if nobody comes to you. When I am dead, will you talk to me? Just like you used to talk to me here. She went on to say, I will. I will be always listening to you if you talk to me. And I don't mind dying if I know you will often talk to me when I am gone. The real Kathleen, the child you've been reading about, is not dead. She is alive in heaven. While you were reading about her, she was with you, anxious to know if you like her. And if you did like her, you have made her happier. If you like her, tell her so. And remember the promise she made, a promise she will faithfully keep. If anyone hears about me and likes me, I will always help them and will help them always to be good. White rose that bloomed for the first time when you left this, this world. I will say a chaplet of the divine mercy for all those who are in this graveyard, including Kathleen's grandmother, who lies with her. Afterwards, we filmed Victor reading out small sections of the letter in a wide shot and other camera angles. Stop. Jacqueline, you were holding the book. Weren't you? You were holding the book at the start. That's right. That's and I want right. you to do that bit where you hold the book up. Yes. Because that wasn't fully in frame. Uh, my finger better not look. I know what you mean, Dominic. What way do you want me to hold that? And then we explored and filmed the rest of the cemetery, footage of which I used during Victor's prayer recital. The weather was not on our side when we went to Ballinrobe, to Brother Conway's grave and to Cray Sanatorium. At the grave we had to re-record Victor's words at a later date as the wind carried away his voice, though we went back to the original audio when he recited a decade of the Rosary. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. The sanatorium looked particularly bleak and foreboding in the wind and the rain. The low building which had once housed Kathleen was falling into ruin and it was depressing to look upon it and to remember it was Kathleen's home for the last year of her life. It still stands as of 2021 but I imagine at some point in the near future it will be torn down. Apart from what Victor said about Kathleen's life while reading the letter to her, we as an audience don't learn that much about Kathleen in this film.
and we very quickly realised that we would have to go back to Ackle and try and tell her story more fully. And in 2014 that is what we did. Brother Conway's story of Kathleen was our Bible on this film. We went through the book picking out scenes that we felt would give the audience insight into her life and Victor narrated these passages along with our friend Ellen Woods. He was the voice of Kathleen. While on screen we would try and bring those words to life visually. We cast my daughter Sophie as Kathleen, though we used her in the film sparingly as she was only seven at the time, a bit too young to be playing a 13 year old. We called the film Kathleen Kilban, the little saint of Hackle Island. It was Victor who came up with the name Little Saint. We felt it suited Kathleen perfectly. We placed quotation marks on the other side to show that it is our little nickname for her and does not imply that she is an actual canonised saint. Well, not yet anyway. We opened the film with shots of us driving to Ackle in the rain and arriving at Kildownet Cemetery. We used the sequence partly to give the viewer an idea where Kathleen's grave is located once they arrive on Ackle Island, and by putting text on screen, we told Kathleen's story up until the point where she is placed in Cray Sanatorium. It was very windy with scattered rain when we arrived at the cemetery, and as with the previous year, we tidied up Kathleen's grave first. This time Victor had built the little grotto for Kathleen, in which he placed a statue of the Virgin Mary. Accompanying him was his great granddaughter Caitlin. He stood with him as he read out a letter to Kathleen and then recited the last sorrow of the Virgin Mary. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, and our Mother, pray for us sinners now, and at the hour of our death. While filming Harry Clark's famous stained glass windows in St Mary's Church, Ballinrobe, in 2013, we met a local lady called Mary. She knew all about Kathleen, and it was Mary who put us in touch with Anne, who was a friend of Brother Conway's, and she had one of the very few handwritten accounts of Kathleen's life, written in Brother Conway's own hand. So while we were in Ballinrobe in 2014, we arranged to meet them, and Anne brought along her book. We were both thrilled to look through it, and I took some photos. We discovered two photographs inside the book. The one of Kathleen that is on the front cover of No More Tears In My Eyes, and the second photo of Kathleen sitting on Brother Conway's knee, along with the brother's dog, Roscoe. This was a tremendous discovery, and we later put it in our book about Kathleen and have shared it among Kathleen's followers online. After a good long chat, we all went to Brother Conway's grave. Victor had made a little plaque for Brother Conway, and I filmed them placing it on the grave, and then they all prayed. It was a perfect little scene for the film. We then drove out to Cray Sanatorium, where I did a bit of filming. It now looked as if the big manor house was lived in, and it had been painted white, but it was still a very eerie and sad place. 
All of the scenes that feature my daughter Sophie as Kathleen were shot at my home in Germany after our visit to the west of Ireland. I also had my wife appear alongside Sophie, firstly as the mother he comes to hug Kathleen at the sanatorium, and as Rita, the fellow patient who spent some time with Kathleen on the night she died. <laughs> I found it quite upsetting when I filmed my daughter as Kathleen for her death scene, and the shots of her laid out with her white dress in the mortuary shed. And four years later, when I filmed the same scenes for our most comprehensive telling of Kathleen's story, in the presence of a holy child, I found it even more disturbing and upsetting. Look at the ceiling. Slowly close the eyes. Hold your breath. Whereas with the little saint film, Sophie just had to lie down and not move or do anything, this time Sophie had to act out the scene of Kathleen's death as written by Brother Conway. This included the build-up to her death where she sees Brother Conway for the last time, then Rita and then the nurse. My wife, who played the nurse, fought back her own tears as she sat on the bed with Sophie. Even today, I find it very difficult to watch this scene. An expectant look came into her eyes. Then her eyes stared open and glazed, and a shiver passed through her body. Then her body stiffened and lay still. She was dead. A couple of months after I had put our first film about Kathleen on YouTube, a woman left a comment below the film. It said, Dominic, how can I contact you and your dad? You won't believe my story with Kathleen Kilban. God knows. I'm writing from Argentina, the country of Pope Francisco. I replied with my email address and so began a correspondence and friendship with Viviana from Parana, Argentina that has lasted to this day. We asked her if she would like to record her story of how she came to know about Kathleen for our next film and she readily agreed. We learnt that it was an Irish man who gave her a copy of No More Tears in My Eyes and that she translated the book into Spanish, which she shared with family and friends. The following is what Viviana told us about her efforts to get the book published in Spanish. It does not appear in her filmed testimony in the Little Saint film. Soon I decided to translate it into Spanish to be published in Argentina, following all the legal steps. Obviously I pursued no economic rewards since I just did it for the love of the little saint. So I got in touch with the editor Fowler Brian McEvitt, he showed himself interested with this idea. But no sooner had I finished my work than he changed his mind. However, I felt pleased by sending the story by email and giving out photocopies of Kathleen's life to my friends and anyone who wanted to know about it. My dad and I both thought that this was a missed opportunity as Spanish is the third most spoken language in the world and Kathleen's story would have reached a new 
and far wider audience. This is the dedication that Viviana wrote for her Spanish translation of No More Tears in My Eyes. I dedicate this humble but dear translation to your Lord for having sent us this angelic being into the world and truly showing us that you can live in it but always thinking of heaven. Monsignor Estanislao E. Karlik. I also thank you for having blessed me with the privilege of bringing this book to my hands from so far away. To your Heavenly Mother for her strong presence in Kathleen's life and thus allowing us to give us one more sign of her unquestionable intervention and mercy. To my spiritual father, St. Padre Pio, for having been the light on my path and the one who will continue to open doors for me until I fulfill a dream. To Brother Anselm, who, without his detailed, deep and heartfelt account, would not have been able to spread much less perpetuate the story of the little saint for the good of others. To the same Kathleen, my spiritual daughter, he accompanied me during all working hours, inspiring me with feelings of extraordinary love. Thank you for your signals. Johnny Caffney, nice and warm Irish man, he sent me the book from his country, is no longer with us. I pray for him all the blessings that heaven can give him. From there, he is now laughing like he used to, but with Kathleen and Brother Anselm. Thanks, Johnny, for the little saint you gave me. I spent a good four months editing the little saint film. A lot of that time was spent listening to hundreds of music tracks to find the perfect music for each scene, and of trawling through countless old films and footage that are in the public domain or under a Creative Commons license. Time was also spent in hunting down the ideal photographs to go with the narration. I remember I spent quite some time finding this image to accompany the narration Earlier that evening I had seen a patient almost at the point of death. Again I was restricted to what is in the public domain or has a Creative Commons license. The alternative of paying for stock footage and photos could easily have run into thousands of euros. But I did pay for the music which I obtained from a professional music licensing service called Audio Network. I think the music I find on their website really takes the film to another level and that's because of the quality of the composer's work. On one occasion when I called to see her, she bid just half a crown from under the pillow and she asked me if that was a lot of money. Cray Sanatorium, 12th of July 1947 To my dearest reverend brother, I am very lonely after you. I miss you very much. I was crying all that day after you left. I cried so much that there were no more tears left in my eyes. From 1.30 a.m. a nurse was with Kathleen, who sometimes talked, but her voice was so indistinct that nobody could distinguish the words. At 2 a.m. on the morning of the 7th of October, the feast of the Holy Rosary. Her voice suddenly stopped. An expectant look came into her eyes. Then she stiffened and lay still. She was dead. After months of suffering, death came peacefully and quickly. I have since used this company for the music for most of the Kathleen Kilban films. In 2018 I went back to the Little Saint film and recut it. I wanted to make a more streamlined version which concentrated more on Kathleen's story and also to correct some biographical details which we had since discovered. In all I cut 15 minutes out of the film 
Both versions are on YouTube and Kathleen's Facebook page. In 2015, we shot our next film, called simply Kathleen Kilban and Brother Conway. It is a very dreamy, melancholic film that imagines Brother Conway's last day on Earth. He visits Kathleen's grave on Ackle Island, and he sees the spirit of Kathleen all around him. We see his memories of Kathleen, real and imagined, and while at Kildarnet Cemetery, he can't help but think of the three great tragedies the cemetery is associated with. The Great Famine, the Kirkintillet Bothy tragedy of 1937, and the Clew Bay drowning in 1894. By the film's end, we see Brother Conway at a beach on Ackle Island, where Kathleen appears before him one last time and leads him to heaven. We rented a holiday house on the shore of Loch Mask, and the first scene we shot was at Cray Sanatorium and is a mix of two scenes from Kathleen's story. The first one being Brother Conway taking Kathleen for a walk, and the second one of him carrying Kathleen over some wet grass as she only had her slippers on. This can be seen as a feeling memory of an old man. Someone wants to come with you. Don't run, Kathleen. Walk. <laughs> Cut. <laughs> Cut. Cut. Come back and let's do that again. Ben, come here. Yeah. When I say to you, would you like that? Just say yes. Could you remember that? When I say to you, when you get your photograph taken, would you like that? You just say yes. Okay. I I want. I. Take your time, man. Take your time. You're all right. You're okay. Uh, slowly. Do it slowly. The next day, we went to the nearby village of Kong. The scene is from the imagination of Brother Conway, as he sits beside Kathleen's grave. We see her by the river, setting up a little statue of the Virgin Mary. We want you to get the expression on your face as you're smiling. You know what I mean? You think you can do this now? Yes. We did the first take and I wasn't fully happy with it, so we went for another take. Just then it got very windy and Sophie fought a losing battle with the blanket she needed to lay on the ground. But filming stopped and Victor walked over to the river and said a little prayer. Dear mother, please make this work. Within a few minutes, the wind abated and we continued shooting. Ellen Woods, who was the voice of Kathleen in our previous film, came aboard this one along with her mother Peggy, who played Kathleen's granny. Peggy was perfect for the part. Being from County Cavan, she was a true Irish grandmother and she brought a bit of the Gaelic with her when she spoke Kathleen's name in that language in the scene where Kathleen hugs her. Peggy was not in the least bit camera shy and when she brought out her hanky and wiped her eyes you really believed she was crying. Of all the people I've filmed, she stands out, along with my sister Jacinta and my niece Caitlin, as being completely unselfconscious in front of the camera. Where does this one sit? Is this in front of the head? Ask sir? the director and the cameraman, I wouldn't have a clue. Yeah, I was just sort of just move them over up, up a bit in the centre, but wait till I tell you to. It'd be way before that goes off, Ellen. Yeah, about there, it's fine, yeah. You don't want to block it. To 
couldn't hit the parish I was born in. Not from here, you couldn't. Sadly, Peggy passed away this year, 2021, having made it well into her 90s. Every year since we made this film, I would make a point to call in and visit Peggy and Ellen every time I visited Northern Ireland and I have the fondest of memories of them both. Peggy and Ellen rented a holiday cottage in the area and as it had a thatched roof, we thought it ideal for the granny's house. So we filmed there the imagined scene of the doctor coming to tell granny of Catherine's TB diagnosis and that she would have to go to the sanatorium. As per usual with our films, where money and personnel are tight, Victor also played the doctor, his only disguise being different clothing, a stethoscope, a doctor's bag and a fake moustache. Ellen's scene is about her meeting brother Conway on the steps of Derreen's church near Kildarnet Cemetery and Brother Conway tells her of how he felt the presence of Kathleen and her granny as he sat in the church praying. Let's try it again, Dominic. Yeah. I, I come in too soon. What brings you here to Ashel? I managed Need I ask? I managed mm. to get stop, away. stop, stop, stop. I cars. I'm rolling. Take 254. Oh, hello, Peggy. Brother Anselm. While at Kildarnet Cemetery, we filmed a lot of footage of the stones that littered the graveyard. They are the graves of the famine victims that are but a short distance from Kathleen's resting place. They are a stark reminder of those dreadful times in Ireland in the mid-1800s that even today touches a raw nerve with many. Such was our feelings on the matter, and that those victims would not be forgotten, we decided to include a famine poem in Kathleen's film. The thought of the suffering of those poor people affected my dad so much that he built the monument in their memory in his back garden. It is not a direct reproduction of a famine house, but an artistic representation of one. Give me three grains of corn, mother. Only three grains of corn. It will keep the little life I have till the coming of the morn. I am dying of hunger and cold, mother. Dying of hunger and cold. And half the agony of such a death my lips have never told. It has gnawed like a wolf at my heart, mother, a wolf that is fierce for blood. All the lifelong day and the night beside, gnawing for the lack of food. I dreamed of bread in my sleep, mother, and the sight was heaven to see. I woke with an eager famished lip, but you had no bread for me. How could I look to you, Mum? How could I look to you, the bread to give to your starving boy, when you were starving too? For I read the famine in your cheek. 
and in your eyes so wild I felt it in your bony hand as you laid it on your child the queen has lands and gold mother the queen has lands and gold while you are forced to your empty breast a skeleton babe to hold a babe that is dying of one mother as I am dying now with a ghastly look in its sunken eye and famine upon its brow there is many a brave heart here mother dying of want and cold while only across the channel mother are many that roll in gold they are rich and proud men there mother with wondrous wealth to view and the bread that they fling to their dogs tonight would give life to me and you what has poor Ireland done mother what has poor Ireland done that the world looks on and sees us starve perishing one by one do the men of England care not mother the great men and the high for the suffering sons of Erin's Isle whether they live or die come near to my side mother come near to my side and hold me fondly as you held my father when he died quick for I cannot see you mother my breath is almost gone mother dear mother ere I die give me three grains of corn When you visit Kathleen's grave, take a few of the flowers that you have brought her and place them at one of the stones that mark the famine graves. We know Kathleen would appreciate that. Let your visit to Kildarnet Cemetery be a time of reflection and prayer. Do not let anger enter your thoughts. It is in the past and cannot be changed. Write actions in the future are the best apologies for bad actions in the past. While at Kathleen's grave, we cleaned her headstone and touched up the lettering with black paint. Then we took Roscoe the dog statue back to our holiday house and glued its face back on and gave it a new black coat with the finishing touch of a blue ribbon and placed it back on Kathleen's grave. For the end scene we needed a beach. We intended it to be the strand which Brother Conway mentions in his book where he says Kathleen played. But we couldn't find it, which means we probably didn't look very hard because it's a short distance from the cemetery and is the only sandy beach in the immediate area. It was a couple of years later that we finally found the strand where Kathleen played, a small strip of sand beside the Clockmore Pier, and at the same time we discovered where Kathleen's granny's house was, and you can see it from the strand. In our film, In the Presence of a Holy Child, filmed three years later, we filmed Sophia's Kathleen playing on the actual strand. So we find ourselves at Glassell Lawn Beach, County Galway, a spectacular part of Ireland that was perfect for the scene where Kathleen takes Brother Conway by the hand 
and leads him to heaven. It was very windy and cold on the day we shot at the beach and poor Sophie was shivering so we had to shoot quickly. Her mum would rush in after every take to put her coat around her. Then we'll cover the rose, face towards Victor. You come walking in the last few steps. There is a post credit scene at the end of the Kathleen and Brother Conway film that I reckon a lot of people may have missed. It's a jokey little scene of two women meeting and having an argument. Then Kathleen appears before them and by shaking her head lets them know she is disappointed with them. The argument is instantly forgotten and they part on friendly terms. We initially set up in front of a gate leading into an old farm building and started filming. Here we shrug your shoulders. Let, let go. We're losing our bet. We're losing our <laughs> so it's not smiling. You have to look grumpy and don't smile. Until my father pointed out that it wasn't a very nice backdrop and he said if we moved a little bit down the road it would be a lot more scenic. That's it now, come out of shot. Right, I would like you two to just walk in, find your marks without making it look obvious and just start the argument. Right? The two women were played by my sister Jacinta and Ellen Woods. I let them improvise the dialogue and after a few attempts, they nailed it. Good to see you face to face now that you can say you saved your uh, pocket. It's hard to do this. Come here, You can call the pet kettle back or whatever it is. Oh. Right. <laughs> we need... Oh, Peggy. Well, Rosie? Now that you have you here in front of me face, maybe you'd like to say what you've been saying to everyone behind my back. No, I think I would rather say it behind your back than be looking at that face for too long. <laughs> Peggy, what were you arguing about? Do you know, I couldn't tell you, was it? God. It was a lovely day though, isn't it? Oh, it's grand. How's Paddy? Oh, he's grand. How's her Tommy? Oh, good. Not so bad. Oh, you know, sure, I'll probably see you at Mass on Sunday. It's nice to All see right, you. Too. Keep well, now. Right, Cheerio. Cheerio. This is the notebook my dad used to write the script. We took it on location with us. Before that, my dad had written down ideas for the film and posted it to me. I then went over it and made my own suggestions and sent it to him. This notebook is the result. When a scene was shot, he would put an X through it and write done at the bottom. We also used it to write notes and rewrite certain scenes. With this film, several scenes were written along the lines of Kathleen being seen by Brother Conway to be helping people. The homeless person in the church ruin is one of them. Some of these ideas did not make it to the filming stage but this following scene did, but for various reasons it did not end up in the finished film. It is shown here for the very first time. Are you all right? 
we called our next film Reflections of Kathleen Kilban, and we made it in 2016. It is made up of testimonies from various people who had contacted my dad because of Kathleen. Their stories tell of how Kathleen has helped them and what she means to them. The film opens with Brother Conway meeting Kathleen by a lake. It is an imagined scene, though we do use some of the words Kathleen spoke as told by Brother Conway. I like to think of this scene taking place in heaven. The shots of the sun reflecting off the water and onto the trees and bushes give the scene a heavenly effect. We filmed at a small lake no more than five minutes from my dad's home. After this scene, my dad proceeds to read the testimonies which the following people kindly wrote down for the film. Patricia Lee and Kathleen Turner, both from London. Mary and Hugh Kilban from Newport County Mayo. Alan Worthy from Wales. Jeremy Clifford from Bristol. Anne Wilson from Birmingham. And Viviana from Argentina, who reads out her own testimony and also testimony from her friends Lorena, Heidi and Julieta. We did not shoot a lot of footage for this film, just the lake scene, Victor reading out the testimonies, a scene of two people finding a white rose in church grounds, and various little shots like these. I mostly relied on stock footage some old home movie footage I had shot years previously, and photographs to visually tell the stories told in the film. It's well worth your time to watch this film, which you can find on Kathleen's Facebook page and YouTube. It's quite unlike the other Kathleen films we have made, and gives you an idea of how Kathleen is important in so many people's lives. Here is a short montage of my favourite moments from the film. I will always be listening to you if you talk to me. Like is very peaceful. I became homeless in England, moving around all the time. How I remember walking the streets of London at night crying, and ending up sleeping in graveyards on wooden planks, covering open graves. All the time thinking of my childhood in Ireland, of how you used to go down to the convent on Sunday Wells Road in Cork City, and the nuns there would let me sit on the bed of little Nelly, of Holy God and show me her little shoes. And it is for you, Kathleen, that I wrote this little verse called The White Rose. Teardrops falling on my father's tombstone, forgiveness for all the pain. Roses are for those we love, the white rose of Saint Kathleen, and the blue candle of the peacemaker running through our lives. Amen. Patricia. While I was in Apple, I headed straight for Kathleen's grave and offered up a rosary of thanksgiving for her. And as I prayed, I felt Kathleen speaking to me, saying, You must love your mother. Promise me. As I began to walk away, I felt deeply and emotionally unmoved, and this openness of heart remained with me for days. This little girl brought me back to the Muller Church, and in the words of Scott Hahn, it's great to be home. Just after Dad had left this world, a strange thing happened. My sister Mary and I were walking to Dad's grave, and there before us lying on the ground was a solitary white rose. Beautiful thoughts of Kathleen come into our minds 
and we know that she was with us. Since Victor had just arrived at Catherine's grave, when he listened to my voice, he had crossed his country to pray for and to her and to make another film there with his son Dominic and some others of the family. Shocking as it sounds, it had never occurred to Victor and me to be filming in Ireland and in Argentina at the same time, for Kathleen's cause. Kathleen was born Tuesday, June 9, 2015 at 7 p.m. Julieta and her husband couldn't believe their eyes. They were over the moon. But suddenly, Julieta became pale and in a few minutes lost consciousness. She was bleeding to death. She was rushed to the operating theater. After fighting for her life for five long hours, Julieta recovered miraculously. This is how the doctor explained the situation, the very word they used. As a consequence of that episode, Julieta won't be able to have more children, but she will live to see her beautiful Catalina growing up, the treasure girl who delights everyone who meets her. I know that some people will find it difficult to see this story as a miraculous intervention of Kathleen. However, I do believe that it was. Julieta was saved thanks to the Kathleen's intercession. I consider it a grace coming through her. Angels adorn the walls of my home, twelve in all. Among them is a special little angel. I pray to her each day and light a candle in front of her picture. How I longed that she could have been my daughter and tell her how much I love her. Her name is little Kathleen Kilban. Back in the summer of 2012, my father phoned Father Brian McKevitt, the editor and publisher of No More Tears in My Eyes. By that time, both my dad and myself had already decided that we would go to visit Kathleen's grave the following year and to make a little film about it. My dad asked for a photo of Kathleen, which the father emailed to me, and this is that photo. As you can see, it looks like someone had been playing around with it in some photo editing software. They tried to define her jawline and chin and made a very bad job of it. I wanted to keep Father McKevitt's photo as it was a high quality image. So in 2014 I took the photo I'd taken of Kathleen in the handwritten copy and superimposed her head from that photo onto Father McKevitt's high quality image. This is how it initially looked. But after spending many hours tweaking and cleaning the image, it ended up looking like this. I then went on to do a colour version of the photo and it was this colour photo we put on our first card. I made the first memory card of Kathleen in either late 2014 or early 2015. It was my dad's idea and he picked out the quotes from both Kathleen and brother Conway which feature on the card. I added a blue ribbon to her hair because the ribbon and her hair were very ill defined in the original photo. I printed them on my home printer and laminated them then posted them off to my dad, he would give them out to people. We had placed an advert in the Ireland's Eye magazine in early 2015, where we offered to send a free DVD of the Little Saint film and a memory card to anyone he asked for them. Over the next few years we produced more cards. My dad would send me a rough drawing of what he wanted along with any text, poem or prayers to go on the card. And I would spend days hunting the internet for the various elements. And then by trial and error, I would piece the card together until I was happy with it. Overall, we have produced nine cards with the imagery of three of them being altered over time. And we have moved on from myself printing them to having a professional printer do the job and they produce them in far better quality than I could. 
In 2018, we were very fortunate to have Sister Anne Hurley of the Order of Consecrated Virgins write a novena prayer for the card we were producing at the time. This was the only card that we produced in two sizes. We haven't just made prayer cards for Kathleen. A few years ago, I also made up a Kathleen Christmas card which my dad sent to his friends and also some adverts which we placed in churches and other places and asked some of Kathleen's followers to do the same. And we and other people have left Kathleen's prayer cards in churches throughout Ireland, the UK and Europe. We even made a Kathleen-inspired bookmark, plus various cards for the grottos my dad has made for Kathleen. Apart from the one he made for her grave, he has made a similar one, which he placed at Kerry Town in County Donegal, where the Virgin Mary appeared in an apparition in the 1930s. We placed the half-crown coin we used when filming in the presence of a holy child in 2018 in the grotto at Kathleen's grave, and of course a card was needed to explain what it was and what it was doing there. And my dad finally got round to building his own shrine to Kathleen in his back garden. By 2016, our Kathleen films and the advert in the Ireland's Eye magazine meant that more and more people were writing to my dad interested in Kathleen's story. They were also writing to tell him of how their prayers to Kathleen were answered and of their devotion to her and what she meant to them. We had already featured some of these stories in our Reflections film. It was my dad who first thought about publishing a book about Kathleen, which would feature similar stories, and work began on the book in late 2016. On board with us was Alan Worthy. Alan's story featured in the Reflections film, and he had first contacted us back in 2015 after watching one of our films on YouTube. He set about researching into Kathleen and her family's background, 
and it was he who made the important discovery about Catherine's date of birth. In the No More Tears book it is given as the 13th of September 1934, but the birth certificate that Alan found at the National Records of Scotland lists Kathleen as being born on the 8th of September 1933, which one is correct? The official birth certificate holds more weight, but by accepting that it is factual, it means that Kathleen believed she was a year younger than she actually was, and celebrated her birthday on the wrong date. But that also means her family believed that she was born a year later than the birth certificate and her baptism certificate states, because on Kathleen's headstone it says she was 13 years old. Did her father give the nuns at the orphanage in which he placed Kathleen the wrong date and year, and that is what they entered into their books, thus carrying forward the error? Or did Brother Conway, when writing out her story a few years after her death, misremember her date of birth? I think the birth certificate is correct, as it would have been filled out shortly after she was born, and the possibility for error was very small. It is also nice to believe she was born on the 8th of September, as that is the birth date of the Blessed Virgin Mary. To gather more stories about Kathleen for the book, and to try and find anybody who knew her, we placed a new advert in the Ireland's Eye magazine. The first part of the book features a summary of Kathleen's life. It features new facts and information that we had unearthed, but it is still no substitute for reading Brother Conway's definitive account of Kathleen's life than No More Tears In My Eyes. There follows Kathleen's obituary and various stories from Kathleen's followers. Our advertising really paid off when we were contacted by Kathleen Burke's daughter. Mrs Burke had actually met Kathleen at Cray Sanatorium. There is also a comprehensive biography of Brother Conway which the Christian Brothers kindly gave us and allowed us to publish it. There's also a couple of chapters about the films we have made and also several poems inspired by Kathleen, written by my dad, Alan Worthy, and local historian, Nolene Beckett Crow. My job as editor and publisher was to gather together all the stories and images for the book and to rewrite, edit and polish all the content and then to present and format all that material into book form. We published the book through the CreateSpace independent publishing platform, which is owned by Amazon. It is basically self-publishing and how it works is that the book is placed on the Amazon website and if someone orders it, then that order is sent to a printing firm who prints off that one copy. The book went live on Amazon on the 3rd of August 2017. It is the Create Space company that checks the book and figures out the cost of printing it, plus their profit margin. And as the book featured a lot of colour images, this pushed the price of the book up. This made it cost more than we would have liked. The following year we released a cheaper abridged version of the book that features only Kathleen's and Brother Conway's biographies. The main negative about publishing the book in this way is that it can only be purchased on Amazon. But I imagine everyone has a relative or friend who has an Amazon account and could order it for them. We also produced an ebook version as well, which is perfect for reading on a smartphone or tablet and is a lot cheaper. In October 2017, I created a Facebook page for Kathleen to promote our book and our films about her and also to share any new facts and information surrounding Kathleen 
It's the place where people can send and have posted pictures of their visit to Kathleen's grave and also to share their stories about how Kathleen has helped them. The page has now got over 2,500 followers. To promote our book, we got a few articles about Kathleen published in various magazines and newspapers. And we placed an advert in the Irish Catholic newspaper. In 2019, we designed and had printed a small booklet which contains a summary or shortened version of Kathleen's story, along with details of how you can find out more about her. By now we had produced quite a few prayer cards, and I felt it was important we also include Kathleen's story when sending out these cards. This was the beginning of what we termed, for want of a better name, the Kathleen Pack, which is sent free of charge to anyone who asks for it. A year later we produced another booklet called Kathleen's Little Miracles and Graces. The title itself tells you what it's all about. We have given Kathleen's booklets and cards to some of her followers who have handed them out in their local communities. And Mandy Lacey from Dublin is very dedicated to spreading Kathleen's story. She has had three pieces about Kathleen published in the Ireland's Own, the Ireland's Eye and the St Martin magazines. She also had little cards and key rings made which feature the Virgin Mary and Kathleen. At the back of my mind, I really wanted to tell Kathleen's story on film purely as it was written by Brother Conway, without any imagined or extraneous scenes and without lengthy prayers, just Brother Conway's words narrated by my dad. Another friend of Kathleen's, Canon Fergus, give her a pious picture. Kathleen thought it was too good for the sanatorium, so she asked Brother Conway to post it to her granny. In our previous films, my daughter Sophie, who played Kathleen, was just too young at the time, and my dad, who played Brother Conway, was just too old to be convincing as a 40-year-old. But by 2018, Sophie was 11 years old, just the right size, I thought, to play Kathleen. But we had no one to play Brother Conway. We couldn't exactly hire an actor, not on our budget. In the back of my mind, I knew that I was the only viable choice to play Brother Conway. I was roughly the right age, and I would be available as I would be shooting the film. I knew I had to come out from behind the camera and it took a while before I gave in to my conscience. Or was it Kathleen whispering in my ear? And told my dad that I would play Brother Conway, which was a big decision for me, as I hate appearing on screen, and my acting skills are non-existent. So we went through Brother Conway's story, and marked out the parts we wanted to appear in the film, and then we would figure out how to shoot them. As a lot of the scenes take place inside the sanatorium, I decided to make a little sanatorium set in my cellar. We picked the biggest room in the cellar and moved all the old clutter to one end of the room, painted the floor a light colour, brought an old fashioned looking metal bed and with a few more bits and pieces we had a very simple and basic looking corner of a sanatorium. Cray Sanatorium's proper name was St. Teresa's, so we felt it suitable to have her statue in the set. I also had to light the set, and in keeping with our use what you've got principles, I used whatever lights we had, plus white cloth over most of them, to tone down the harsh shadows. And in keeping with those principles, 
We searched the house which has been in my wife's family for over 90 years and found various period items and props for the film. For me it wasn't important that the set looked very realistic because it would be the people within the set and their story that we would be telling that was important. We paid particular attention to Kathleen's costumes. The night dress she wears in the film is actually one my wife wore when she was a child. And the white dress Kathleen wears for the death scene was my wife's first Holy Communion dress. I hunted through eBay to find the right outfit Kathleen wears for her scenes on Ackle Island and her walk with Brother Conway, which included a tartan beret with a small coloured feather, which is described in the No More Tears book. I had to shave off my beard for the film, and I put a brown powder on my hair to knock a few years off me. We started filming in the cellar set in June or July. So I'll be seeing you next week. Take care. All right. Bye. Bye. We would film about two to three times a week for a maximum of two hours at a time. Unlike our previous films, which were mostly shot in Ireland in the two to three weeks I was there, we had the luxury of taking our time and we could reshoot scenes I wasn't happy with. Sometimes reshooting the same scene up to three times. I was even filming little bits and pieces and doing retakes as late as December when I was editing the film. Right, let's do it again. I'll say my line and you try and keep looking at me, Pop. I devised a method of shooting which would make it easier for my camera shy self and Sophie and not tax or limited acting skills. My dad, as narrator, would speak any dialogue that comes from either Brother Conway and Kathleen, and we would just have to speak those lines normally, without worrying about how it sounded, because I would sync up the narration to your mouth movements when editing the film. I said to her on one occasion, when you go to heaven, you will be a very busy girl, helping people just like you used to help the patients here. Her face lit up with pleasure as she replied, that is what I would always like to do, helping others. And in the scenes where we are shown to be talking to each other, with no specific dialogue in the narration, we would just chat in general without sticking to any sort of script or I would give Sophie direction on how the scene is to be played out. Listening to, talking to Sophie. That's a lot of money for a little girl to have. So it is. Mm-hmm. You have all... You little shit. Mm-hmm. She smiles, maybe. Mm, I'll look down at the coin. <sighs> that was terrible. <laughs> that was, I spent some time trying to find a suitable prayer book for Kathleen. It was an important prop. Brother Conway had given her it, and it is mentioned several times in the No More Tears book. When Kathleen died, the matron made a point of going back to Kathleen's locker and retrieving it, and it accompanied Kathleen to the grave. I could not find a pre-1946 one, that was suitable, so instead I got this little white First Holy Communion Child's Prayer Book from the 1950s or 60s, which came all the way from the United States. I roped in my friend Paul Seston to play the part of a patient. We used him for the scene where we see Kathleen helping the nurse give out medicines and for a shot where we see Brother Conway with a dying patient. We film this scene in the same cellar room. We just moved Kathleen's bed, put a different blanket on it, 
and placed a different bedside cabinet beside it. <laughs> and our neighbour Anna Teresa agreed to play the part of Rita. He visits Kathleen on the night of her passing. We didn't just confine our shooting to the cellar. We film this scene in our hallway and this scene in my study. We achieve the fire effect by using a gold coloured screen with the light shining directly on it and my wife would shake the screen to simulate flickering flames. We film this shot in our kitchen, and also the mortuary scene with Sophie lying on the kitchen table, and I plucked the white rose in our back garden. One day I decided to take our dog Nellie down to the cellar with us when we were filming. She had been with us for almost five years by then, and had never set a paw in the cellar. She was too frightened of it. It was a mysterious place to her, where we would sometimes go and make strange noises, like chopping wood for the fire, and she was always glad to see us returned above ground safely. The first thing she did on entering the cellar room was to trot over to Kathleen's bed, and jump up on it for a bit of fussing from Sophie. In mid-August 2018, we went to Ireland, north and south, to shoot scenes for the this film the and to record the narration with my dad. We needed a wet and windy day for the scene where Brother Conway is walking home from the sanatorium with an empty jam jar. The unpredictable Irish weather didn't keep us waiting long and on a Sunday morning we filmed the scene five minutes from my dad's house. We also filmed a few letter reading and writing shots. If you look at this envelope, which contains a fictional letter Kathleen wrote to Brother Conway while he was in Cork, you will notice that the address is for the Christian Brothers Monastery in Cork City. This is a real address, and while we don't know that Brother Conway stayed there, it is very possible that he did. You may also notice the postmark on the envelope. It is also correct. I searched the internet for old Irish postmarks and stamps and printed them onto the envelopes. And if you look closely at the postmark, you can see that the date corresponds to the time that Brother Conway was in Cork in 1947. A little bit of photoshopping was needed for that. On our way to Ackle Island, we stopped off at the parish church in Strayed, County Mayo as it is one of the few churches on our route to Ackle that retains its altar reels. We film the shot of Kathleen kneeling at the altar reel, then she gets up and walks out of shot. We use this in the film to signify her leaving the orphanage in Scotland and going to Ackle Island. After arriving on Ackle and getting settled in, my dad and I eagerly went to visit Kathleen's grave. It had been two years since my dad had been to her grave, and three years for me, and it was like visiting a dear old friend. Don't think he needs painted, does he? No, he looks quite fresh still. Look. Somebody's mentioned to me they've done a solar light. Yeah. If the right, it does look a bit faded on the headstone though, doesn't it? Yeah, a bit of a there. And that can be yeah. touched. That can be touched in. Yeah, freshen that up. Look at the wee stones. And even, you see this here? Heart shaped stone. Yeah. He's a <laughs> Showing the shape. Oh, yeah. Yeah. 
photograph that door. I want to show it tomorrow. Buds. There's buds on it. Yeah, there's still so many leaves and all. And I, the bugger's been scoping on it. I'm well placed with them steps. Yeah. That was nicely done. Up there. You know something? People will appreciate that. Yeah. You wouldn't divorce this place looking after it. Yeah. There's basically no other grave like it in the whole cemetery. Yeah, I looked around the edges now. Yeah. But... We also popped into the Ackle Secret Garden, which we believe was the woods near Breenaskill, which Brother Conway mentioned where Kathleen liked to play. We asked the owner at the time, Willem van Gore, the Dutch artist, if we could film there, which he kindly allowed. The Secret Garden was our first stop on our first day of shooting. Remember, don't look at us. Excellent, well done, pup. Then it was to Kathleen's grave, where we filmed Sophia's Kathleen walking along past the cemetery and of her calling in to the church ruin. We filmed her at Kildavik Tower and then at the Strand a short distance away. Then it was back to Kathleen's grave where we got stuck in tidying it up which I filmed and later turned into a short film. Grey Sanatorium was our next stop. We filmed the scene where Brother Conway and the matron are walking to the mortuary shed the morning after Kathleen's passing and the matron remembers Kathleen's prayer book. We also filmed Kathleen and Brother Conway going for their walk and sitting down and chatting plus some shots of myself as Brother Conway walking to and from the sanatorium. We also filmed the little scene of Brother Conway taking Kathleen's photo, which gave us the two only known photos that exist of Kathleen. It did not end up in the film because the background of a wire fence and a dilapidated sanatorium building in the background would have destroyed the illusion that this took place in the 1940s. I could have just cut in the original photo of Kathleen, but I made the deliberate decision not to show the real Kathleen until the end of the film, because it would have detracted from the audience's belief in Sophie's performance as her. My dad had gone to the trouble of finding a bent wood chair, 
So we could recreate Kathleen's photo with Sophie. And I took lots of photos in slightly different positions. But I don't think we quite got it. Sophie was getting restless and a bit self-conscious of being photographed. And I was getting frustrated. We really should have tried again later when we had all calmed down. It was a missed opportunity. Then we visited Brother Conway's grave where we filmed Sophia's Kathleen, placing potted flowers on his and George Devery's graves. I put this little scene at the end of the re-edited version of the Little Saint film from 2014. While on Ackle we find ourselves at the top of Mehon Heights, which gives great views of the island and beyond. I photographed Sophie, he still had her Kathleen costume on, and it was one of these photos that became the basis for the film poster I designed for the film. Kathleen always seems to be looking out for us when we're making the films, because in early 2018, Caroline from London, whose family come from Ackle, got in touch with us because of her interest in Kathleen. And when she heard we were going to Ackle to shoot a new film about her, she very kindly offered to let us stay in a house that belongs to her family. As a dog lover, I was very pleased to meet Carlo, who stays there as the house guardian and we filmed the little scene by an old ruined cottage with Carlo and Sophia's Kathleen. Thank you, Caroline. I edited the film alongside doing retakes and other little bits of business in the cellar set throughout the autumn and into the winter. As usual, countless tunes were listened to and hours of old footage watched and the film slowly took shape. I finished it in late February. The editing had taken a lot longer than usual, as I was determined to make the best film possible. I decided to enter the film into a few Christian religious film festivals throughout the world. I find that the price of a music license for films screened at festivals rose steeply with my usual company, Audio Network, so I searched for a cheaper alternative, which I found in AudioJungle.net. Even so, the music ended up costing around 350 euros. I entered Kathleen's film into seven festivals, at a cost of around 200 euros. Along with the costs of props and costumes, the film cost just over a thousand euros to make. Overall, I find the film festival experience to be a failure, but to be honest, I don't really care. I'm very proud of the film, and I think it's one of the best films we have made, and up till now, the most definitive film made about Kathleen. Anyone who doesn't know about Kathleen, and who watches the film, will come away with a very good sense of her story and of Kathleen herself. I talked to her and I knew she was listening as she had promised. It was hard to realise that the child I had known, had played games with and who had so often sat on my knees, had already gone on to that long journey into eternity, had seen God and now knew what heaven was like. The day before I released In the Presence of a Holy Child on Kathleen's Facebook page, I received an email from Eddie Cotter, Jr. 
Eddie founded and runs the Dead Theologian Society, which is a Catholic youth ministry program for teenagers which teaches them about the saints and their special charism is to pray for the holy souls. The Dead Theologians has been running for over 20 years and over 17,000 young people in over 550 parishes have participated in it. Eddie has even started chapters of the society in Ireland, North and South. When Eddie holds DTS meetings with the teenagers and young adults, he usually tells them about Kathleen, and because Kathleen was a young teenager herself, they can easily relate to her. We have made sure that Eddie has plenty of Kathleen's booklets and cards so he can share them out. He is a great advocate of Kathleen and when he was in Northern Ireland in the autumn of 2019, he made time to call in and visit with my dad. You would have thought that we had finished with the Kathleen films. There were no more to make. We had covered her story the best we could with the Holy Child film. Well, I thought that, my dad didn't. He came to me with an idea he had of an old man whose wife has recently passed away and he discovers her copy of the No More Tears book which he reads and is deeply moved by. It explains the photo of the girl that his wife kept on her altar. He remembers his wife once telling him that the girl was her little friend and she would like to visit her grave. The old man feels so much guilt over this that he decides to walk to the girl's grave and place on it a picture of his wife and her rosary beads. I liked the idea and we turned it into a script. This was in the spring of 2019 with filming planned for early August when I would be in Ireland for 12 days. And from writing the script to the film being released on YouTube and Facebook in November, we did it in only seven months. My dad was partly inspired by the Martin Sheen film, The Way, which was directed by his son Emilio and was set on the El Camino pilgrimage trail. For various reasons, we decided that my dad's character would live in County Donegal, one of them being it is a more scenic route. We also decided that my mother would be the deceased wife. My mum had passed away in 2005, and I thought it would be a nice touch to have her appear via photographs in the film. I had to work a bit of magic when I was editing the film to change the date of her passing on her headstone from 2005 to 2019. In the sequence where the photos appear, the narration talks about how they like to go off hiking and sleeping underneath the stars which is complete fiction. Indeed, because the film has a documentary feel to it, and it features my mum as the main character's wife, I wondered whether some people may think it is a true story, that my dad wasn't very religious, and that he walked all the way from Donegal to Ackle. I can safely assure you that the story the film tells is completely fictional. It was time for me to upgrade my camera from HD to 4K. My old camera, which had shot all of her films up to this point, was a very small consumer camera. Any manual functions on it were in the shape of very small buttons or through the touch screen, which wasn't great for my big hands. And our way of shooting, which is very much in the guerrilla filmmaking style, which is characterised by ultra low budgets, skeleton crews and limited props using whatever resources, locations and equipment that is available and where scenes are shot quickly in real locations 
without any filming permits. So I would just have the old camera on full automatic, which often led to less than ideal footage. With my new camera, the Panasonic G81, I purchased Caleb Pike's video guide to using this specific camera and learnt the three most important things when shooting with manual settings aperture, shutter speed and ISO. I also treated myself to an external camera monitor so I could see a lot more clearly what I was shooting. The new camera performed wonderfully and my main regret was not getting it earlier and shooting the Holy Child film with it. We filmed all the scenes that appear at the start of the film at my dad's house and at Ballycran Church at my mother's grave. Then it was off to County Donegal. I have to make a making off film, you see. That skirt's packed to film. Is it? I think. Oh no. Is that? Yeah. Keep your hands held together, pup. Yeah, I oh, got there, yeah. Yeah. And you, you just look at them for a few moments and then turn away again. Yeah. Right, look at them. Yeah, lovely. Turn away. Turn That's away. It. About that length of time, pup. No, no, sorry, Victor, 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 Victor. You can't go here that way, she's looking at you. You don't let her turn, look at you, and turn away again, then do the type Yeah, that's right. All okay. right, so just keep your eye on Sophie. When she turns away again from you, then you yeah. do the hanky. All right, so back to where you were. friend May Malloy from Donegal kindly agreed to appear in the film. I know that little girl. That's Kathleen Kilban. You know, yes. You, you know her? Yes, I actually have a photograph of her. Oh. Yes. There she is. With the little blue ribbon. I don't don't believe this. Yes. I don't be claiming up that one. Right, let him have the book, May. <laughs> He's clinging yeah. on to it. <laughs> this was fantastic because all the other dialogue scenes my dad has with characters he meets on his travels were the usual suspects of my wife Bed, my daughter Sophie, and my sister Jacqueline and her granddaughter Caitlin. So it was nice to have a fresh face. We improvised these scenes. I would describe roughly what they needed to get across, and they just went for it. My favourite is Caitlin's scene, which I find quite comical. She was practically interrogating my dad. Where's that at? Down in County Mayo, in Apple Island. How are you getting there? Going to walk. People have offered me lifts, but I'd rather walk. Going to walk from y yeah. here yeah. to Mayo? Yes. That's not very far. It is. It is, but I'm a young man. I'll make it. Would you like a wee bit of information on her? This place. Right. But like, it's uh, County Mayo, not a bit far to be walking for a wee girl. I know, I know. But but that's what I do. Alright, okay. Is that alright then? Yeah. Are you happy? Yeah.
Yeah. That's okay. Have a good time. Thank See you, you later. Bye. Bye. There were a few locations in Donegal where we wanted to film, like Kerry Town and the Asaranka Waterfall. Otherwise we kept our eyes peeled and any locations that looked interesting as we drove along, we would stop the car, get out and film a few shots of my dad walking his pilgrimage route. We also did this when we drove from Donegal to Ackle. Of all the films we have made, I find this to be the least stressful. For most of the time it was just my dad and I filming. We both knew what we wanted and we just got out there and did the job. Off you go. Where do you want me to move down that second post there? I'll tell you to stop. Right. You ready? Go. To some degree we also improvised when filming. While in Westport, where I filmed my dad walking through the town, he stopped at a full-sized figure off Chewbacca and had a good look at him, felt his beard and held his hand. And while we were eating lunch in a cafe, I sensed an opportunity and got the camera out and filmed my dad eating. That's my wife's arm to the left of him. I don't remember if we planned to stop at W.B. Yeats's grave on the way to Ackle or we just did it on the spur of the moment, but I was glad we did, not because my dad and I are fans of the man, but because I had heard a few years previously Yeats's poem, The Lake Isle of Finnish Free, sung by Tony Barden, which I particularly liked and was keen to use in one of our films. I will arise and go now And go to an free And a small cabin built there Of clay and wattles made Nine bean rows will I have there a hive for the honeybee And live alone in the bee-loud The ending of the film takes place at Croke Patrick and as in 2015 when we shot the Kathleen Kilban and brother Conway film, my wife and daughter climbed the mountain for a second time, dragging Caitlin and Jacqueline along with them. It was quite an achievement for my big sister, who made it all the way to the top. I was obviously gutted that I couldn't do the climb with them. My dad and I had to go and film in the nearby town of Westport. My dad and I are not the only ones inspired artistically by Kathleen. Mark Reddy wrote a poem about her, especially for his mum. Mark said, My mum passed on in February last. She found a little book many years ago about Kathleen Kilban from Ackle, who died in 1947, aged 14. It's basically the story of a child saint. My mum loved the story and brought many copies of the small book to share with people. Anyway, it prompted me to write this for my mum and Kathleen back in 2007. I'm glad I did. I've been to Kathleen's grave many times in Clockmore. Here is the poem which Mark has called no more tears in your eyes. Resting there so young and fair, and as your story goes, you're home now dear, home from the pain, you're home with your white rose. Though you have gone, I sing this song, we have said our last goodbyes, 
In hills of mist and amethyst, no more tears in your eyes. Your time with us was short and sweet, your story sad and tragic, but yet, my dear, I visit you and feel a special magic. You're in my heart and in my mind, you've touched me deep inside. I know the pain is over now, those little eyes have dried. Remembrance, love's greatest gift, and yours is a treasure. To visit you in this sweet place will always be my pleasure. My dad and I, along with a lot of other people, firmly believe that someday Kathleen will be canonised and become a real saint. It is a long and rocky road to sainthood, and the Catholic Church vets each candidate very carefully. Each and every one of you can do your bit to help Kathleen become a saint. Tell your family and friends about her. Tell your fellow parishioners at your local church. Pray to Kathleen, and if she answers your prayers, write to us and let us know, because what you will have written will be evidence that will join a growing pile of other stories of favours and possible miracles that are attributed to Kathleen. I would like to end this film by showing this clip from our Little Saint film. What you will hear are Kathleen's own words, written down by Christian brother Morris Anselm Conway. They are very powerful words, spoken by a selfless, holy child. I remarked to her one evening, when you go to heaven, you will not have a moment's rest. You will be so busy helping people, just like you always did here. Her face lit up with pleasure as she replied, That is what I would love to be doing, always helping people. Suppose people ask you for something. Would you mind going to God and asking for it? I asked. She thought for a while before she replied, I don't know. I'm not sure until I go there. I might be afraid to go to God, but I know I would not be afraid of the Blessed Virgin. And that is what I will do. I would ask her and she would ask God. And I will always remember those who were good to me. What about those who did not know you were here and would have helped you if they had known? And then she made this extraordinary statement. Anyone who will hear about me and who will like me, I will help them too. I will help them to be always good. I am never alone here, the crowds you draw near. To a little green along the sea, I'm so great. Oh, hey.
as it shines in the light so pearly and bright the gift of our friendship ignites if you need me just call me i'll always be What fun I had here at this beautiful place Full of laughter and dreams My life full of grace Growing old is not an option for me Where the sky meets the sea that's where I shall be. A ribbon of blue in your lovely brown hair. That lock is still fresh, a beauty so rare. Blue is my color, which now serves you oh Ireland, your island your home white and blue white and blue are the colors of our lady white and blue white and blue are the colors that she wore